<laughs> Welcome to the virtual star party for March seventeenth, two thousand thirteen. Um, we've got uh, we've got a couple of te- three telescopes here tonight. So let's uh, let's sort of introduce everyone. So the first person I'm going to introduce, and I don't know whether he has a camera for himself, but this is Andrew Dumbleton, who is in England, and he's bringing us Saturn. Yay! That is awesome. And it's three thirty in the morning. Andrew, can you hear us? I can. I can. It's uh, it is very, very early, as you say. Why have you not gone to bed? Uh, well, I almost did and then got up again. But uh... <laughs> Because we're here. And he, wants, he wants to share his view of the universe. That's why. Yeah. Well, I, I love that, uh, that little view of, of Saturn. Is there any way to make it larger or... If, if I do, it goes very dim. I'm going to actually, uh, you can see it disappearing now. Um, okay. So that's going behind, behind the roof of my house. What I'm going to do is... <laughs> that's uh, that's can why you it's remove feeding the roof of your house. house. Yeah. I'm going to mute my microphone and slew to something a bit more useful, I think, for you. Okay. Or destroy <laughs> your house. Right. Yeah, I'm yeah, we're okay with that. that. <laughs> um, we're okay with that. Uh, no, that's, that's fantastic. Um, Goodbye, Saturn. Well, see, but I, I actually like this because this is our chance to sort of ease into the Saturn season. And so, you know, we start the virtual star party, we get a little bit of Saturn, and then that's it. And then later on, of course, you know, May, June, it's going to be all Saturn all the time with five telescopes. And yeah, it'll be great. All right. So I've, I've got distracted and waylaid. So we've got Gary Ganella from Los Angeles. Hello. There's Gary. We've got Roy Salisbury, who is providing this beautiful view of, what's this, M81 and M82? Yes. Nice. Um, Scott Lewis, also in the Los Angeles area. I know. I feel so far away from you now. <laughs> I know. I know. I miss you. <laughs> it, feels, it feels very strange to, to sort of not see you here in the flesh. As it's a person. true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now we're seeing virtually, but uh, but it was really cool. People didn't know uh, we did South by Southwest last week, uh, and we did our last virtual star party from uh, right in front of the big model of the James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, it, was it was awesome. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. It was and, cold, uh, but it was awesome. It was really cold, <laughs> but we were able to sort of. Uh, hook up this uh, janky, uh, you know, whole bunch of, of laptops. We and, MacGyvered and, that so yeah, well. We totally, it was amazing. And, yeah, and internets, and we actually were able to do it in front. We had lots of guests come by, and it was yeah. it was actually a lot of fun. I was, yeah, uh, we had Alberto. We had yeah. Tony there. We had Camilla Corona, the, the SDO's rubber chicken. We had Karen. <laughs> yeah. We had so many awesome guests yeah. throughout our entire yeah. time. Tony there. joined us for the for the show yep. as well. So, yeah, it was that was really heartening to know that we could actually do this on the road. And so I think uh, hopefully yeah. as we get more. Well, you know what? Actually, I'm going to be on the road. I'm yeah. going to be for the next uh, two and a half weeks. I'm going to be traveling down the, the west coast of uh, – of the United States. And so, so I say we crash at Gary's house. Yeah. yeah so if we'll, you, if there will know. definitely be a live show. I think at Gary's house, Gary's that all right with you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, <laughs> By the way, great. Gary, is that all right? If we come over, <laughs> all right, we're yeah, coming absolutely. over. Uh, I'll bring, I'll bring some kind of salad. <laughs> Some kind of macaroni set. Beer um, craft beer <laughs> And we got, we got no Dr. problem. I don't want to be married. No, <laughs> Uh, and so we're going to get into the uh, into the objects that we're looking at. But but uh, Thad, you were out uh, observing for the last couple of nights, showing people comet pan stars. Now we don't have a live view of pan stars because it's already gone down for even our folks on the west coast. But I know you took a bunch of pictures, so can you uh, can you dig some up? Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, get one of those up here. So <laughs> now can you can't see it with the unaided eye in. LA. Some of my students were able to, I believe it was Tuesday, it was Tuesday or Wednesday night that they were able to just barely pick it up um, after sunset there. So this was from last um, Sunday night. This was from a rooftop in Venice. Um, And again, I had, it it was not a visual object at all. So I just shot a whole bunch near the horizon and got home and was like, all right, we're, oh, there it is. Good, good, good. So, because I had gone out Friday and Saturday night and tried shooting it from near Santa Monica Pier, figured, okay, let's have an iconic object in the foreground, um, but couldn't find it. But then Sunday night, it was, uh, was able to, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday was able to show it to my students and a bunch of people who showed up at Cerritos College to to get a look, and they got to see the crescent moon, they got to see Jupiter, but you know, most importantly, if they got there on time, because the thing was set by ten of eight, five of eight p.m. So, um, but if they got there on time, yeah, they got to see it. So, a couple hundred people. And so, you know, for people who are watching this right now, what's the way that they can see it, and and how long are they going to be able to see it for? 
So for the Northern Hemisphere, the the it will be staying longer in the sky. It'll be setting later, but it's also getting fainter. So you're going to need binoculars, um, kind of sweep along the horizon um, to the right of where sunset happened, you know, within probably about 10, maybe 15 degrees of the horizon. It's not very high up at all. The other thing is I saw reports on um, was it spaceweather.com that it's starting to break up. Um, I did see actually, that. Wait, That's that, right. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, some pieces are coming off of it. Yeah. So the thing is, as you're watching it, if you want to continue to follow this comet, you, we might have two or three comets, you know, following each other one after another, each with their own individual tail, if it is starting to break up. So from a, a photographic point of view, um, if you are an astrophotographer and want to target this, it's getting farther to the north. By, I think, late April, it becomes circumpolar for most of the U.S. So, um it won't be very. It won't get very high at any point during the night, but it will be up all night long, and it might be more than one comet at that point. Now, do you think that might actually make it brighten up if it breaks up? I mean, isn't that what happened with was it Comet McNaught? I one did that. Um, not McNaught Holmes. Holmes had a very Holmes. bright outburst. Yeah. It was supposed to be like magnitude eight, and suddenly it brightened to like magnitude two. So we never know. I mean, it depends on how it breaks up. If it breaks up in a way that releases a lot of new ice and new dust, yes, then we'll definitely see some brightening. But I think with any kind of breakup, you'll, you'll see the two, the individual pieces start to move separately. So I would expect within a few weeks to see um, more than one tail. Okay, that would be cool. Um, and then just to let people know, this is, I, you know, I'm calling this the year of the comets. I've called it. Um, so it's going to go down in history. Uh, pan yes, stars. Sure. Actually, this is the second one. We had, we had one about a month ago, and now we've got pan stars. And then we've got lemon coming up, right? Right. Um, and that's going to be in May, April, May. And then the big one is going to be Comet Ison, which is going to be at the end of the year. So this Hopefully, is going to be... Mean- if Pan Stars is already breaking up, I mean, who knows what Ison's going to do? So we hope right. so, but yeah. you know, let's uh, let's not let's try not to build expectations too nope. high. And then everybody's why, like, "Why, why are astronomers why? lie to us?" It's like, what is the no way? We, we are know. we would never we're, lie. We, would never lie. We, are, we are putting it in context. People are yes. aware that Ison could be a non-event or the greatest comet in the history of all mankind uh, ever. So, it, so, ever. Ever. So, so it's going to be somewhere in between that range. So on the one hand. Just it'll peter out, nothing will happen, or the most bright comet seen in the day. So, uh, you know, between negative infinity and positive, yeah, infinity, and positive infinity, somewhere in there, somewhere in there, there that's I, a reasonable I feel, expectation. I feel so. confident in that prediction, so right. I, don't worry about it. All right, well, let's get, so, uh, oh, you get another picture here. Yeah, so this is, I mean, on um, Tuesday night, it was adjacent to the waxing crescent moon and with the moon in that phase you get a lot of earth light so you can actually see the full disk of the moon as light bounces off the earth and then shines down on the moon and that light is reflected back you can you can get the full disk as well as the the sunlit crescent portion there and so yeah and we're uh, we're posting pictures on universe today like crazy so if uh if you've got pictures of of uh of the comet and you want to send them in we're always glad to uh to post them so um, all right, well, let's get moving through the objects that we've got happening here. So first, before we, uh, before Gary moves on, uh, Gary, what have you got here? This is Thor's helmet, NGC 2359. And the, um, the light over in the right area is because I've got a slight cloud cover and I'm looking very to the north or very to the south, excuse me. Right. Normally when we see this, it's because the moon, the stupid moon is uh, washing out, but that's not happening in this image. Luna. Nope, this is happening. The moon's too far away. This is... This area is light cloud cover, and I'm looking over the Ontario airport area, so there's also some lights coming up from there. Oh, and speaking of the moon, we're giving away uh, 10 free copies of the uh, Phases of the Moon app oh. from Universe Today. Tell me more. Uh, tell you now, now how much would you pay? Um, so, Wait. Yeah, so I'll just show you here. So here's the, uh, so here's the app, right? There it is. Now, this is the Android version, right? But uh, but yeah, we're giving out, giving away ten copies of the uh, of the iOS version. We can't give away copies of the Android. I would give them away, but we can't give them away. So anyway, we've got a, a giveaway over on Universe Today. So if you go to Universe Today, just put your email in a box, and then uh, you'll be entered automatically in the draw. Um, really, you can't get, you can't even do sales. No, no, you can't give. Away, no, you can only give away. Uh, you can essentially you you have you can print off 
promo codes in uh, for the iTunes store, but you can't oh, okay. do it in Google Play. So you can't give away Android copies. Although we have a free version of the Android one, so you can just download that. And, and the free version is great. Yeah, the free version is yeah. it's fantastic. I've got the paid on yeah. my phone, but I've, on my Nexus 7, I've got the free version just because I haven't, I've been too lazy to, to <laughs> install it and reinstall it. Right. And so right now, tonight, the stupid moon is is sort of like a quarter moon, half moon. So it's, it is definitely washing out a little bit. It's not too bad. Um, and we don't have anybody with the right field of view or, or camera for showing right. the moon, correct? Nope. So, yeah. Nope. I could pull up Stellarium if you'd like. I don't know. If you Andrew, know. is the moon still up for you, Andrew? Or is it, uh, it's oh, probably it's long gone there. for Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, not until it's uh, further along. Um, okay, so so now what is Thor's helmet? It is an emission nebula. So the we're, helmet of Thor. That is the helmet of Thor. And there yeah. we go. The hammer's got to be around here somewhere. Yeah. You're welcome. So is there a Thor's hel- uh, hammer? I don't know if there's a Mjolnir I nebula found one. So, no. but who knows? I mean, you know, with with Hubble, with Wise, with Herschel, with you know JWST launching in a couple of years, we'll find something. It'll look like Mjolnir. We'll call it that. Yeah. Um, but I, for now, I, we've gone to this before, right? The Pac-Man Nebula, right? The Wizard Nebula. Like there's right. objects that you know people don't realize what it is that they're looking at until later on the thing comes along and they're like, oh right, of oh, course. Well, that's what I thought that's it was. What it is. It's the yeah. Pac-Man Nebula. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. But I mean, this is this is a region of, of hydrogen gas, and again, Gary is shooting with a filter that only shows this specific uh, wavelength of hydrogen. So one of the things that you need to do if you're shooting from slightly more light polluted skies, like around uh, around Los Angeles, but because there are no street lights that glow strongly at this um, at this wavelength, you can still do photography, even from the Los Angeles area. Um, using a hydrogen alpha filter like this. So this is sensitive to ionized hydrogen gas and the electrons are recombining. So the electron gets kicked out. It says, hey, that's a positive charge. Let me come back over there. And as they recombine, it will emit um, this characteristic red light if uh, if you could see the, the color of it. So. Awesome. I'm going to move to Roy's view now. Roy's got a, some kind of cluster going on. That is M67. Okay, so this is an open star cluster in uh, the constellation Cancer, and there are some trains of thought that think our sun may have come from this cluster. If really? You, if you look at the ages of the star, so the, the thing is, if you have one star off by itself, you can get some feel for its age. With a cluster, the more massive stars will die off first, and then the less massive stars and less massive stars. So you look at which stars are currently red giants. And so if you look at that for M67, it puts its age at right about f- between 4 and 5 billion years old. Well, the sun's 4.6 billion years old, so there is a um, possibility that um, this was like our baby picture, maybe. So yeah. nice. Yeah, I've I've uh, pestered uh, Pamela about that, and and she is unwilling to to sort of commit that that it is that there is a place out there that our you know that is the nursery where our son came from. But uh, the the thing is, we've had you know. It, the solar system orbits the galaxy about once every 220 million years. So roughly a little more than four times um, every billion years. And if we've been here four and a half billion years, that's like 22, 23 trips around the galaxy. And there's so many interactions with so many other potential star clusters and whatnot in that time. Yeah. There's, there's really no way to trace it back. That is, you know, you talk about a two body problem in (laughs) computers and physics. This is like a, multiple billion body problem yeah. and then some of the stars have died since then some new ones have been born so it gets even worse than just your typical oh it's a game of billiards see what the yeah. sun has shot off of mm, no that's not going to work because some of the balls have disappeared and some have formed since uh if we go back in time oh gary so, uh kyle maxwell is asking for the horsehead nebula and i know you're in, okay. in ryan right now so i'll bet you that you could probably reach it i can andrew i see I'm not sure whether it's a street light that's happening in your image or there was something there. What were you homing in on? I, I think that was the Star Vega you were seeing. It should be blank at the moment. Yeah, it's blank now. Okay, I'm just waiting for a countdown to see if I can get the Ring Nebula. Oh, that would be great. Again, all of these previews of these objects, I love it. These objects we won't be seeing for another four months. So, all right, I'm going to move to Gary's view now. Oh, look at that. Hey, this is our friendly neighborhood, Ryan. Yep, yep, yep. Alpha. 
Speaking yeah. of stellar nurseries. <laughs> well, so. right. So this is, this is something like what our sun formed in, right? Well, somewhat. I mean, the thing is here, there's what's called an initial mass function. It's, it's how you get what, what distribution of very large stars and medium-sized stars and small stars. And Orion seems, the Orion Nebula seems to be excellent at forming these extremely massive stars. And because they are so hot and so bright, this is why we get this blown out glow in the middle of the, the nebula here. There is so much energy being dumped into there by these uh by these newer younger extremely massive stars that you know even uh so gary how long of an exposure is this uh that's a one minute so just yeah just even a one minute exposure and you can't see the individual individual stars in the middle there it is just washed out from it being too uh, even even a 10 second bright. exposure they're washed out yeah yep yeah. yeah. So I just want to remind everyone that this is actually live and uh, the objects that we're looking at are live. And so we're glad to take requests or answer any questions that you might have about either space and astronomy. As you can see, we have Dr. Thad Zabo, who is a walking, talking uh, Wikipedia of, uh, of space and astronomy. So he yes. can answer any questions. Um, and, but also, uh, you know, if there's any objects that you want to see. So there's a bunch of places you can do that. If you're watching this on the event page on Google+, Plus, you can just post a comment there. If you're watching this sort of anywhere on Google+, Plus, we, we try and catch all the reshares. Yep, I, um, I've got it so it's shared out so we should be able to see those comments yeah you can if you on twitter if you just use the hashtag uh star party star uh, we'll party that yeah yep. and then if it's um on youtube we'll get the comments there and uh and that's great and we, as pamela always says we can you know try and boost the quality of the conversation on youtube so yes uh and, and to comment a little bit on thad's uh awesomeness when it comes to astronomy when the first time I met Thad in, in Meet Space, we were at the Griffith Observatory. And we were walking around just talking about all the awesome stuff. We had a people, a group of people <laughs> following us as we were walking and talking about the different observatories. And we, we had a following just listening to us nerd out. So that is awesome. That it was amazing. Fun. Like that. We should yeah. do that. You know what? I'm going to be down in L.A. in a little while. Oh, we yeah, should meet yeah, the yeah. Griffith Observatory in, you know. In the in April and we'll uh, or in, in March and we'll we'll hang out and see if we can get a, a trail following behind us. So <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So uh, with this image of the of the Orion Nebula, sorry, what was the the exposure time? It was just one, one minute. minute. One just minute. One yeah. Minute. <laughs> so I yeah. mean, this this is one of many nebulae that are present in Orion, but because of those massive stars that are present in this nebula in this particular nebula this this is why it glows so brightly so there's a lot of faint nebula in fact if you were to do a long uh, uh, a long uh, photograph of the entire constellation of Orion you can see just a loop it's called Barnard's loop and it takes up most of the constellation this kind of just little faint ring of hydrogen um, yeah actually wait I've got a kind of uh, experimental light polluted shot of the uh, constellation Orion when I was trying to get pan stars. I can go get that. So, sure. no, we yeah. don't see Barnard's Loop. We see a little bit of glow from LAX and Ranchos Palos Verdes, but we don't see Barnard's Loop. But let me see if I can go, go get that one. Uh, yeah, LAX uh, is nasty with the light pollution. Uh, <laughs> or just yeah. to be at. <laughs> um, so even... Kelsey Jewett asks, where are Nicole and Pamela? I believe Nicole is recovering from her return from Chile. Yeah. And we're all jealous. Uh, so she went down for the opening of the ALMA telescope down in Chile and uh, was doing a ton of reporting live from from Chile and uh, lots of great pictures. And yeah, I think she did a he, hangout with uh, Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society. Yeah, yeah, and I think she, you know, came back a little ill. So uh, is, she, had is a, she had a good kilo of, of dirt in her lungs just from being up there. Yeah, yeah. it's a lot of it's, it's pretty dusty up there. Um, uh, BTL743 asks me, Fraser, did you ever want to study astronomy? I understand you're a computer guy. That's right. I have my degrees in computer science, not he in astronomy. He hates astronomy, guys. He but, hates it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. You know what? I sort of looked at it and said, that, like, I'm not really great for research. My brain doesn't really work that way. Um, and so I knew that I wouldn't be sort of the guy to, to sit and, and do research and uh and i really like uh working on software and, and building stuff so but i did uh universe today on on the side as a project and it kind of turned into my full-time gig i'm not really sure how it happened but uh sometimes when you have a hobby and you just sort of do that hobby it can turn into a career so that's how i how it's how i got into it um I, you know i've always been tempted to go back and and get my 
astronomy degree, you know, or maybe, you know, turn my computer science degree and get a master's in astronomy or something. But <laughs> that's so what we have Pamela for. That's what we have Pamela for. Right. <laughs> I, I have PhD astronomers I can reach out to and ask uh, questions at all times. So I, I think uh, I'm okay right now. I, maybe later if I have a lot more time on my hands. Uh, Darren Harkley asks, is this live? Yes, this no. is live. What, no, is no, this is not live, live Darren. <laughs> this is coming from the future. Daylight savings <laughs> time. It's an hour ahead. That's right. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Gary, you can move on at any point if you've got something else queued up. Okay, I'm working on it. Okay, all right. I'm going to show Thad. So, Thad, what's this a picture of? So, th this is Orion, um, as shot from Santa Monica Beach with a, a Nikon D80. Um, so, fully open aperture. Um, what was I using? Like 10 second exposures. But this is the complex that houses the Orion Nebula. So if you can see where the belt is here, and I don't know if this is showing up on the resolution that people can see on YouTube or whatnot, but here's your belt stars. Below this, this is the Orion Nebula complex. Um, the Running Man Nebula is also in there. The horse head hangs off of the far eastern star of Orion's belt called uh, Alnatak. And I mentioned Barnard's Loop. Well, if this wasn't from a horribly light polluted area, Barnard's Loop takes up this enormous portion of uh, the sky through Orion like this. But we also got the Hyades in here, the star cluster about 220 light years away. We've got Jupiter. And if you want a big version of this picture, you can see things like M35 and M41, some other star clusters that yeah, you know, well, even from a light polluted beach, you can pick up if you yeah. really play with the levels. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I mean, if if you've got a DSLR, if you've got like a um, I'll go back to Gary's view here. Um, uh, yeah, if you've got a DSLR, you got like a Canon, like a T3i, or you've got a Nikon, um, you know, and you do like a thirty second exposure, you can see the Orion Nebula right there. It's this great little kind of ghostly cloud in the in orion so it's a great first object to get because you can usually get kind of all of orion and the nebula and even you know other more fainter objects in that whole region as well yeah the thing is you just need a good tripod i mean there's you, there's really no way to do this holding it by hand you, you need something to set up on but that's it just a tripod and your dslr and you can take photographs of constellations yeah yeah so. Actually, all of the comet photos that I've been showing are just DSLR and tripod. This, what Gary is showing right now, no, no, this, you need a telescope to see this. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, and you, I mean, you need a special kind of telescope and filter to see this. Right. Well, um, you're really not going to see a naked eye. I've seen the Flame Nebula, which is over to uh, below Alnatak on the, the lower um, left portion there. I've seen that yeah. naked eye, but the horse head, it's... Is too faint. Um, I haven't tried from someplace like Death Valley. Maybe if you get someplace where there's absolutely no light pollution, you, you might be able to. Um, but even the flame, that was from near Joshua Tree. And it's, you know, typically you can see down to about magnitude six and a half out there. So, um, so this is very faint visually. But again, you have a hydrogen alpha filter. That's hydrogen alpha that is glowing and, and causing the uh, horse head silhouetted in front of it. So, well, yeah. Um, and Gary's set up giving me trouble here too. Yeah, yeah, I can see you've got those those high clouds. Usually your your image is a lot crisper, so Wisp I can see it. I'm running blind going wherever I'm putting it. So I tried yeah. uh, Leo's triplet and just couldn't get enough there to make any sense out of it. What, would that be our planetary nebulae getting in the way? <laughs> oh, this yeah. bad joke. Nothing uh, to do with anything at all. They'd definitely be nebulae. <laughs> yeah. So but not planetary nebulae. Something completely different. Not having to do with the planet at all. <laughs> but but still, you know, the if you are looking from you know from Spanish, right? Nublado. Yeah. You know, that N B L is all in there. So you know. So so what actually creates this horse head shape in the nebula? So there's dark um, material. So if you have a thin gas and you hit it with a lot of energy, the, it will glow with particular colors depending on what element is there. Most of the stuff that's in space that is made of the, the same elements we are, most of it's hydrogen and helium. And so you find hydrogen everywhere, so it tends to glow this reddish color. If you get these thicker knots that are colder, then they don't let light through. So what you have is this background of hydrogen glowing, um, lit up by Alnatak, and then you've got this little knot of extra dense, cold 
um, gas and dust in front that's blocking the light mm. from coming through from the hydrogen behind it. So, so if you were to head out there and possibly like see this from the other side, it wouldn't look like a horse head at all. It would just be, well, there's an emission nebula and we don't know what's on the other side. Right. And so. I guess, I mean, with that star on the left there, Alnitac, which star is that in the constellation itself? Because, I mean, that you can see with your own eyeball. Easily. That is the far eastern star in Orion's belt. So it's the one farthest to the uh, to the left. To the left, right. So when you're looking at Orion, you're seeing the belt. That's the star. And if you could somehow look at it with the telescope eyes that could see hydrogen alpha, then uh, you would see, be able to see that flame nebula, which is the one that's just below it, and the horsehead nebula. Although I'm trying to think, is it is it upside down when you... It hang, it's so it's it's the star is here and then the the nebula with uh, the horse head in it kind of points south from yeah. from Almatac. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, it looks like this. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it, you know it's the other way. Yeah, what would be so. like a minimum setup to be able to see? this so visually again the flame i mean i've i've seen it with a nine and a quarter inch scope so if you're if you have a dobsonian um a lot of these star clusters galaxies nebulae they're they're accessible for from an eight inch or ten inch scope that would maybe run you four hundred to five hundred dollars if you want to do photography that's another matter you yeah. need something very heavy stable and something that will track the sky for you so if you're uh, a DIYer like uh, Corey Schmitz who does a lot of <laughs> yeah uh, he's a ninja force, when it comes yeah, to total ninja you know, yeah. then, yeah. then you might be able to come in low budget like this if you're like me and you're just like just give me something that works you're going to be spending a couple thousand dollars to get the scope and the tracking and then probably another couple grand more to get the camera that can actually um, take these kind of photographs for you. <laughs> yeah, right. Now you work for, you know, now you're tenured. It's like, no, we totally need this. Let's get a yeah. grant going. Yeah, exactly. well, this yeah, equipment. We, we do have a new mount for our 14 inch on campus on order. Oh, I'm nice. anxiously yeah. awaiting that and then see? hoping we can just line people up to see Saturn when it becomes uh, visible and at reasonable right. times. So, right. But, but I would say, you know, to start getting images, you know, not super long, like five hour long exposures, but to get like a, you know, to get a nice two minute, three minute, five minute exposure, you know, a $500 telescope, $800 telescope with a pretty good mount is going to get you with a, with a DSLR as your CCD is going to get you yeah, most DS of the way there. DSLR and, um, Again, you, you need a, a good stable mount. You need something yeah. that when you put that extra weight of the DSLR on there, that it actually stays in place. We had this problem, you know, a friend of mine, fellow faculty member, and I were trying to photograph the comet, and both of us had tripods that were just too weak for the lens that we wanted to use. So as we're shooting, we just see everything kind of droop down in an exposure. So, um, so yeah, so if, if you talk to astrophotographers, they will tell you, well, it's the mount, and then it's the mount, <laughs> and then it's the mount and then whatever yeah. telescope and camera you put on there that's um that's uh second that's almost secondary but but how well it can hold its position in the sky and follow the motion of objects across the sky yeah. is uh, i mean gary roy um andrew can you would you uh, would you agree with that? No, oh, without a doubt, I so, yeah. Oh, yeah. suffered through a lot of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so you can save yourself a lot of misery and just get a really nice stable mount, and then you know get those the pesky telescope part later. Yeah, just don't pull a Stuart Foreman and right. tip yours over. No, it tips, yeah, when you carry it in your in your wagon. Right. Um, I've, I've moved to Roy's view here. Roy, what are we looking at? This is M one hundred eight, and it's Thanks. really small. I'm not sure whether people yeah, can see so it on. Boards. I was going to enlarge in it, but uh, I didn't know how much time I had here. The, Lots uh, of time. It's a, it's a barred spiral galaxy. And close to edge on also. I mean, we're, we're yeah. looking at this, you know, if you have a spiral galaxy, um, wait, I don't have, oh, see, I'm, I'm, I'm not at my usual desk, so I don't have the CD to show that, you know, okay, you can have a, a, a spiral that looks like a disc or you tilt it on the edge. And, oh, okay, thank you, Scott. All right. And so, again, so you get a face on or edge on. This one is closer to edge on. And, Scott, if we could demonstrate that, thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> then, uh, you know, that's uh, that's of use. Oh, and Fraser's. I don't teach the, astronomy at all, you know, ever. Okay. Ever. Um, oh, yeah. And here's Cinnamon Lin Linux, everybody. I recommend it. <laughs> I was using Willy Wonka. There. But, uh, but yeah, this is an Ursa Major. Ursa Major is kind of rife with galaxies. You're looking out. You know, again, if you're looking at our galaxy, there's the plane of the galaxy. When you're looking through Ursa Major, you're looking kind of out toward the, the northern galactic pole of our galaxy. So you're not looking through all of the gas and dust that um, 
we're embedded in within the Milky Way, you get a view out to the side. And so Ursa Major, you can see many galaxies. There's also a planetary nebula, which is kind of near M108. The Owl Nebula is nearby here. I don't know if... Uh... I'm going to try that next. Okay. Awesome. So right. we'll move to uh, yeah. to this this thing that Gary is showing us. Uh, uh, that Fraser I hates. No what that I hate. I just hate um, it. That's a one that's minute. A, I'm cooking a two minute right now. Wow. <laughs> that is still. an amazing amount of detail for one minute. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm still the clouds you can see on the left now. I just got wispy clouds going through here. Yeah. So do you hate this almost as much as you hate astronomy? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hate <laughs> oh, so if anyone has no idea what we're talking about here, this is the rosette. And, uh, but when we, there's Google did this video, a documentary about, uh, or an advertisement. I'm not sure what you call it. And, documentizement awesome. about uh about us and about the star parties that we do and it starts with uh gary noting that i love to see the rosette nebula and we always start with that because that's what fraser likes and demands yeah rosette so. or nothing go rosette home nothing. yeah go so what, home i mean what is it and why does it look so cool so it, it's a little bit further evolved than, say, the Orion Nebula. You have all these hot stars and whatnot that have formed in the oh, middle. You and did the two minute, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the two. And that's starting to okay, play. Fraser. Yeah, <laughs> this is just like it just it fills <laughs> Gary's frame, and it's got these dark dust lanes in it, and it's got this structure, and it is the perfect. It is really the object that shows off Gary's capabilities just perfectly. I mean, it's, it's just the only thing I can see. That's it. <laughs> it's the only thing you can see right now. The one object. Yeah. So. And it's, I mean, just to keep, like, how many moons is that? That's probably, what, nine full moons, six full moons? If you're talking area-wise, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. about, you know, um, three full moons across, two top to bottom, roughly. Yeah. So I know oh. I can't fit it in one field of view with my hyperstar. Yeah. Um, so, but again, it's more evolved than, say, the Orion Nebula. This You're looking at the hot stars that formed with it in the middle, and the pressure from the radiation has kind of cleared out this little bit of a cavity in the middle. So you get this kind of ring-like structure, this opening in the middle, and then the, ga the hot gas is still dense enough to show all the structure. You see these dark lanes where the gas is starting to knot up and possibly, you know, form more new stars. Um, so, you know, as you, you get a, a region kind of evolving, um, it may look like this, or it may look like the, the Cone and Christmas Tree Nebula, which is also nearby, or it could look like Thor's Helmet, or it could look like the California Nebula. So all these possible varieties of, of how these emission nebulae can form depending on what the local environment is like. And in this, play, in this place, it was, you know, star cluster forms in the middle and just starts to drive out the gas kind of radially. And so you have a little bit darker ring in the middle and then still all this incredible structure around the outside. So then over time, would you just get more and more of this looking like a donut it would start it would look like your donuts being eaten away mm, but from places donut. on the inside so yeah not the homer simpson like oh, i'm right <laughs> the bite out of the side but the places where the gas gas is collapsing where you see these kind of dark lanes through um the nebula here you'll get new stars forming there as the radiation pressure increases it will dissipate the nebula more and more so anything that we look at in the sky it's a snapshot in time this is how it looks right now give it 20 million years and all you'll have there pretty much is a star cluster and not really the nebula around anymore if you were to have gone back you know 50 million years in the past, then again, you wouldn't have this nebula here. You would have some dark gas regions. You probably would have had a, maybe a bunch of supernovae went off in this area and it's filled the region with enough material to make new stars. Or you just have a cloud of stuff that was moving around our galaxy and conditions became right, supernovae going off to get new stars to form from it. So the, the stories that each one of these tells is very, very um, individual to its own history. Is this your photo, Roy? Yes. That's just sick. I, I yeah. took that about uh, about a month ago, a month and a half maybe. You disgust wow. me, Roy. That is <laughs> that is not right. This is the <laughs> but I, I love your color choices too. I mean you you know, I think what's really important for people to understand is that the colors that we're seeing, the blues and the yellows and the browns, I mean this is Roy's selection of the colors for the different It's a it's a standard palette cover, color that most yeah. of the uh, narrow band uses. Yeah, yeah. This is this is called the Hubble palette, and so we assign a greenish color to hydrogen, we assign a bluish color to oxygen, and a reddish color to sulfur. So, really, when you're seeing the different colors here, you're seeing different element concentrations. 
Wow. Uh, Christopher Moran the, asks, do we see YouTube comments or Google? Uh, both. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And I see one question here from was it Chet1138 um, asking about why I went with a color CCD camera instead of doing narrow band filters like the one that Roy just showed. Yeah. Um, main thing is I've, I've got a hyperstar and no permanent place to set up. So if I go out, I want to be able to capture stuff that night and come back and have to process it and not have to go out and try it again and try it again. So it's mainly um, expediency until I actually have a place to set up a telescope a little bit more permanently. At that point, I'll probably get a monochrome camera and, and, and do narrow band but also not have to drive an hour and a half if, and then drive an hour and a half back for <laughs> right. anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you don't have that H alpha filter, do you? No. And because I have the, the color CCD for, for my camera, there's, there's no point. I would end up losing three right. quarters of the pixels if I put an H alpha filter on there. So, so here's the owl nebula, I think. Yes. Yeah. Nice. It's and, so uh, fuzzy. and something, uh, it's so cute. Looks like a satellite. satellite. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Now, I am, I'm going to push for something. I've been pushing for this on Mike Rector's photograph, is that we have the Owl Nebula, and there's a galaxy right nearby that we were looking at before, M108. I want to call that the Pussycat Galaxy. So we have the Owl and the Pussycat. They're right together in the sky. Okay. Let's, you, I mean, you got my vote. Do you, okay. you, think, you think we have that kind of clout? I, I think I we do know. Because you got 80 on clout, right? Oh, wrong yeah. clout, right? Right, wrong clout. I'm 65, you're yeah. 80. 84, <laughs> 85, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's awesome, though. What is the Owl Nebula? That's a planetary nebula, right? This is a planetary. So when a star a little bit more massive than our sun dies, you know, it's kind of this very gentle symmetric death as the outer layers kind of drift off into space over tens of thousands of years. So what you're seeing is a structure here, probably about a light year or so, maybe a little bit bigger across. And in the middle, there's a tiny little star that has a white dwarf. That is the remnant of the core of that star from when it was alive. And that is... Uh, pumping the oxygen and hydrogen around there with uh, plenty of, of ultraviolet radiation and getting it to glow. Is, is that it in the middle there? That, that little star, do you think? I'm not positive. Yeah. But if I had to go with too the, dim. If I had to go with a candidate, no, typically they are very dim. Like the ring yeah. nebula, it looks like you have the central star and you don't. Yeah. Um, there's, there's some other candidates in the, that are intervening that uh, trick you into thinking they're the central star. The dumbbell, you can see the, the central white dwarf pretty well. And the owl, yeah, I think, I think you're getting the, the white dwarf in the middle. So the question here, um, Wendy uh, Mares Sixtos asks, uh, why is it that some galaxies are spiral and others are more round shaped, making an elliptical galaxy? Ah, terrific question. So, oh, we're going back to Royce. Oh, because space Royce. is awesome. That's yeah. why. This is your photo, right, of the owl. This is an older photo of the no, owl nebula. I was. He was talking about how you can see the central star. This is uh, a planetary nebula I took last week. There's a central blue <gasps> star in there. Nice, huh. nice. And here oh, with the yeah. zoom that is this right. with the Hubble palette or is there this is. um is this no that's that's natural color if you want to call it natural okay. So again, so the hydrogen is glowing kind of pink and the, yeah. the oxygen is glowing kind of blue. Um, to get back to the question from uh, Wendy, who is one of my students. Hi. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Extra credit. Essentially, yeah, yeah there we go. Um, if galaxies collide, so you can get these kind of nice spiral forms depending on, on how the, the gas and matter that forms the galaxy kind of collapses, it starts to spin up. But the problem is when you get spirals collide, it kind of tears apart all that structure and what you're kind of left with is a ball. So your spiral galaxies are um, kind of less evolved types typically. They haven't undergone collisions. They haven't undergone things that kind of tear up that structure. Right. So not so quite as evolved as us. Well, mm -hmm. you know, less less I should say shouldn't say maybe less evolved, less entropic, less you entropy, go. you know, in uh in your spirals. That's so. right. You're a PhD, use your big words. <laughs> but if yeah, I mean if you get a bunch of collisions where, you know, you've got two, say, spiral galaxies colliding, one this way, one that way, you're gonna get just a big cloud of stars when it's done with it. And, right. and so when you see those big clouds of stars, those are the older, more evolved galaxies, right? With a lot of they're a lot redder in 
Sort of with the That's the other thing. The collisions force out all of the gas and dust that you can make new stars with. And so those older elliptical galaxies are often called red and dead. That you've stripped the, the pressure from the collision has stripped out all of the gas and dust. There's no material for making new stars. So all of your young stars die off quickly, or your hot, massive stars die off quickly. You're left with older, generally cooler, redder stars. Yep. Um, Andrew, how are you doing there? I've, I see something and then it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's just doing about a 50-second integration now. I'm actually standing in a cloud. Uh, <laughs> wow. You've <laughs> come down to ground level. Me. Yeah, I yeah. can hardly see any stars again, but uh, I've okay. got uh, M13 that should be popping up in a minute. But Andrew's a dreamer good. over there. <laughs> this is, this is just going to make that time when you actually do get a nice, clear sky view of Saturn all that sweeter. So don't worry about it. I hope um, so. Uh, Gary. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51, right? I thought I'd look yes. in the other part of the sky and see if I get a little more light. It's yeah. kind of weird that the, the water vapor, the clouds you're dealing with are, are painting like one side. It's, it's Well, it's, yeah. Um, although the other one I got the, I'm getting different sides, but I might be doing up out there too. Uh, mm. Okay. But yeah, so if we're talking about, you know, kind of grand design spiral galaxies, this is, this is a classic. This is the uh, M51. This is a spiral galaxy. It's about 25 million light years away. So as you're looking at this, you know, think about what you were doing 25 million years ago. And that's when the light left to, to come to nothing. your eye. So, Absolutely nothing. <laughs> But, uh, but this is, there's an interaction going on here. There's a smaller galaxy off to the left. And with, even with this exposure, you can kind of see how it's pulling some of the material out from the main Whirlpool galaxy. So you have the Whirlpool, which is NGC 5194, and the smaller one is 5195. And even longer exposures show even more intricate interactions between them, provided you don't have to deal with dew or other water vapor that's <laughs> Messing with your on your telescope or in the sky. I, I went outside and sneezed on his telescope. And really <laughs> but I think I think this is great. I mean, I think it's really important to see. I mean, you know, we could be. I'm going to switch over to Roy's view because this is this is what Roy, when he's you know has the telescope going for long periods of time and he does it in separate three separate filters and then or in this case I guess it's one filter but he'll do three separate filters and merge them together and produce a really beautiful image and you saw his his rosette nebula image just just previously as well and so you know we definitely are doing this live and with all of the constraints and really you know one of our goals is to always show to try and give people a real sense of what it really is like and not, otherwise, we might as well just be showing pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. So right. that's that's why you know <laughs> there's a difference between the live stuff that we show and then the sort of the rendered stuff that people have sat down and really taken a lot of time and and care to try and you know produce that final right. image, so. which which we love. But you, yeah. you can put that into the our the space community that we're that yeah. we run and moderate. Yeah. So or, there's a great or, place for that. You know, we'll, we can just sit and like look through the Hubble Space Telescope coffee table book. You know, like right. It, right. You know that's you know that's a that's a different show, but in this case we try to mix it up and try to show both the the live stuff that's really happening and you know in this case Gary's dealing with cloud and you know rain on his telescope or dew or you know that that that's the sort of that's what the that's what astronomers are dealing with as they're doing their stuff live. It's the weather. It's you know we've we've only got three people here tonight. Everybody else is rained out, clouded out. So this is the uh, this is the reality of astronomy, but I think you know this is what we're trying to go for. Right? Can I break the rules and show a processed image of uh, yeah, fifty one? Roy already Roy already, already broke the rules. Yeah. All right. rules. Rules are out the window now. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> been broken, we'll be fine. This um this was a pair of photos I shot a week apart. This was back in um. Well, almost two years ago now, at the, the end of May and beginning of June of 2011. And so this is a slightly you know, more processed versions of the Whirlpool Galaxy. The thing is, a supernova showed up um, in the intervening week. So this star blew up about 25 million years ago. And in just that week is when the light reached here on Earth. And suddenly there's this extra star yeah. visible. Um, so the Whirlpool has been a pretty good factory for these. There have been, in the past 17 years, three supernovae visible in the whirlpool galaxy so there's a lot of you know uh cases where you have hot either hot stars collapsing or possibly a white dwarf eating a smaller star or white dwarfs colliding or white dwarfs stripping gas off of a, a more massive red giant and that's gonna make your you know your your 
hot, dense core of a star explode and be a billion times more luminous than it was before. So you can even see it as an extra star from 25 million light years away. Wow. So Very cool. All right. Um, well, I think Here's we're... The uh, got, there we go. It's M1. Yes. M1. Messier's first object in his catalog of... Well, I mean, what he came up with about 100 during his lifetime, and then they added another 10 or something. I can't remember the exact numbers. And what if Messier really found them already? He's like, yeah, I don't like that. And now yeah. they're attributing it back to him. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you saw yeah. this. I see it in your notebook. Hey, yeah. I, do this, I do this with my students. If they're in lab and they make a sketch, I'm like, you drew this. What's the name? Label it. Get more points. Right. So, <laughs> more so points. I see, I see another question here which uh, from David Guerrero. Uh, okay. What is the common Another shape student. or look for? That's what I figured. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the common shape or look for a galaxy? And bonus, yeah, you get some bonus credit here, David. So, what's the common shape or look for a galaxy? Um, again, it depends. You know, if Big. you, if you have, yeah, enormous. I mean, <laughs> absolutely, really, incredibly enormous. Um, but it depends. If you if you have a galaxy that has a lot of gas and dust, and there's rotational motion to it, you get this spiral design, like we saw on. Um, M51. Uh, the other thing is what's coming up right now and which will start to feature more in the star party are all these elliptical galaxies in Virgo. So if you're in a cluster, you're more likely to find elliptical galaxies. If you've got loners out there, they're more likely to be spiral. So, uh, Michael Busby asks, uh, what software is being used to combine imagery? Is the imagery freely available? So when you do that composite, Roy, what, are you, what software are you using? Photoshop? Um, well, Photoshop comes into play later on. I use the same software I use for my capture, which is Maxim DL. It does the, the acquisition of it, calibration, and stacking. And then once I have that stacked, I take the tip image, move that over to Photoshop, and do stretches and levels and very, various things with it. Uh, and does, does Maxim DL cost money? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes, like a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. Yeah. Does it cost uh, a lot of money in astronomy terms? <laughs> in, in a, compared to the rest of it? No, it was pretty cheap. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, there's yeah. another one that I use quite a bit called Nebulosity. Yeah. Yes. And I got started because uh, one of the early star parties I went to, the guy that writes it, uh, did a session on it. Okay. And, and I love it. There's I use... Maxim to capture because it lets me apply all the flats and all the, you know, the darks and yeah. everything at one time. Uh, right. When I use nebulosity, I have to do it manually, but it's, it's a very easy to use. So I still do a lot of my processing in it. Right. So I guess, I guess when I say, is it cheap? Like, is it cheaper than, for example, setting up a telescope compound a state away um, and, uh, and, and controlling it remotely? Uh, yeah, which that's is why really, it's really cheap if you caught yeah. that. Yeah, I, I think yeah. Nebulosity is like forty nine dollars something. Like okay, forty nine dollars. Yeah, Nebulosity is really cheap. buying land. Yeah. yeah, I think Roy's Roy said I'm, this is Roy's setup, which is just awesome. Do you have a picture of your of your of the compound, Roy? Can you show um, it? Yeah, I can bring one up here. Do you have the space dungeon, Roy? Show us your space dungeon. The space dungeon. Do you space want a dungeon. daytime view or a nighttime view? Uh, let's either one. Yeah, let's do both. Um, um, you have a live view, though, don't you? Uh, yeah, I can do a live view, or relatively live, anyways. Uh, and this is, we'll you know, at, at a hidden location. This is where we're all going right. when the zombie apocalypse comes. Right. We'll just flip over to this and and share the whole security page here. Oh, not the security page. <laughs> They'll know where we are. Uh, he's we in go. a Faraday cage. He's safe from all oh, okay. the extra, you know, signals. So, <laughs> so they're being tracked. Oh, it's all blurry. My, oh, there we go. Oh, now it's working. Nice. Check that out. So you can see he's got like a, is that, does the whole roof slide back there? Yeah. yeah. Half, it slides halfway back to the, over the control room. Yeah. So half the building's exposed when the roof slides back. That is great. You can, uh, here's, here's one during the day. That is so great. <laughs> that is dedication. I built that with my own two hands. That's and some wood, it looks like. You're yeah. Right. Man and I got <laughs> a little bit of wood, a little bit of solar panels. And so you didn't 3D print it out? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> have you, have it's, you... It's a scale. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. How, how, how close is your nearest neighbor there? I mean. Uh, probably about 
five, six miles. You can see awesome. way where my mouth is here. There's there's a house way back there up on the hill. That's fantastic. Um, oh, Chet113 uh, is asking, did you ever mount anything on your second pier? Um, I've got uh, my 8-inch that I mounted this weekend that I'm going to try out tonight for the first time and see if I can. I'm going to try to just master right hunting with it. Oh, wow. Okay. And if it doesn't work, work. The, the problem, of course, is that if it doesn't work, you'll have to. Well, you're not there right now, are you? No, no, but no, I can control it from here. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, I think we're going we're gonna to see one last object before we, before we move on uh, for the night. I think we'll wrap it up after this. Um, Gary, what is I it? Have, uh, this is a piece of the California Nebula. Oh. Even my field of view isn't enough to get the whole thing. It's about <laughs> a third. Because this you is wait. close to three or four degrees across from uh, yeah. from the Mexico border up to the Oregon border. Yeah, right? and I'm, so. I'm a degree and a half by a degree. So, but how, I think how is your here. sort of life's work of building the uh, the full the full composite image of the oh, North American well, Nebula? I've been getting distracted, so we. <laughs> That's really cool. So, but again, this is another emission nebula, another region of, of hydrogen gas. And again, you can see, I mean, maybe you can see some similarity in, in the structure from this and like one side of the Rosette Nebula, that you have these bright filaments, you have some, some dark knots in there. Um, but there's certainly no kind of nice kind of round symmetry with this, like with the... Uh, with the rosette. This is more like if you took just like kind of one side of it and kind of straightened it out a little bit. Yeah. So you see some similarity between regions that, you know, you have kind of bright areas and darker, cooler, denser areas. Um, but no two are exactly alike. Mm -hmm. And here you can see when I flipped it, that this is kind of the Bay area here. Yeah. Yep. Going up the coast. Awesome. Hi, Stuart. What's up? Um, <laughs> you can see Stuart there, yeah. Um, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Roy's last view then, and then we'll uh, – oh, it's the meh. It's the meh triplet, right? It's the meh. Yeah. Meh. I'm from galaxies. That's a two-minute exposure. I could have life out here. You just don't know. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so we've got M65 up in the upper left. We've got M66 in the upper right. And then it's at NGC 3628 as an edge on all of these three spiral galaxies in Leo, kind of near Leo's hindquarters. Um, some interesting interactions. M65 is messing with M66. So the one on the left at the top is messing with the one on the right at the top. And so you actually have a spiral arm that kind of, you know, typically you have the spiral arms all lying up plane m66 actually is one that kind of bends out a little bit because of the gravity from m65 messing with it wow. and that's that's technical language it's <laughs> messing, messing with ah. right don't they are they you say saying that 65 is a big butt it's, isn't it it's isn't it galactic harassment there it is so rather than galactic cannibalism yes this is just harassment m81 yeah. is harassing m82 stop it. so does that mean we should call the shadow proclamation yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've decided I'm calling this yeah. meh triplet. Meh. Yeah. Womp, womp, womp. Triplet. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, you know, uh, I think we, we've sort of reached an hour. Time goes so fast. Um, so I think it's I time to, to, to wrap things up. I know you could. I know you can. And I know you want to test out that new pyramid, but save it for next week. Um, <laughs> and let's go try and get Panzers if, if we can, because it's going to be higher up, I think. So hopefully we'll be able to get pan stars. Maybe we'll start a little early just to do pan stars if people are are up for it. Of course, I'll be somewhere on the road. I'm trying to think where will yeah, I be? Portland. Be yeah, I'll be in Seattle or Portlandish. So anyway, we'll see if I can. If if not, it's going to be Scott. So, um, and there's Andrew. Yeah, sorry, you'll be stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for thanks for braving it at three thirty in the in the morning, Andrew. We really appreciate it. And uh, now four thirty, uh, it's probably time to get up and go to work. So it it is. I'll, I'll try and have a couple of hours. But uh, yeah, sorry about the no show again. Say I'm completely no stars again. But uh, that's, that's we'll all right. try another week. We had a little yeah, bit of no, Saturn there for a while. Yeah, a no, that was bit. great. You got, got us that preview of Saturn, so that's fantastic. Gary, thanks again for for bringing the view. Sorry about your clouds and and dew. Okay. Um, Glad and Roy, I don't know if you're still the meh triplet, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Meh. <laughs> cheer up, Roy. Cheer up. <laughs> cheer up, Roy. Cheer up, man. <laughs> you got a, you got a new telescope on a new pier. This is you should be excited, but you know, 
Not feeling it tonight. But the galaxies are saying meh. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Roy. And uh, and Scott, what's yes. next? Is it well, astronomy it? cast? Astronomy tomorrow? cast tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. We hope. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't know. Is Pamela's down at the at the conference? Yeah, she's she, at LPSC, right? Right. Yeah. So you, I don't know if she's. Com- no, we'll have to call science. her. Yeah. Yeah, we'll find out. There may or may not be an astronomy cast tomorrow. We're not sure. Right. And then yeah. there is learning space coming up as long as Nicole is feeling well enough for it. Yeah. The Planetary Society's Hangout is on Thursday, and then we have the weekly space hangout on Friday. Awesome. All right. Um, Dr. Zabo, thank you very much. And uh, thanks very to uh, to all of his uh, his class for watching <laughs> yes. tonight and providing great questions. And uh, good luck with your tests. Yes. No. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll see you all later. There you go. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you. Good night.